Good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings from Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. My name is Joe Weiler, and I'm a professor emeritus at the Peter A. Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia. And I'm co-director with my friend and colleague, John Ritchie, uh, at the Anti-Corruption Law Program. The pro our program is a joint working partnership between the Center for Business Law at the Allard School of Law uh, Transparency International Canada, uh, and the Vancouver Anti-Corruption Institute, which is a new program of the International Center for uh, Criminal Law Reform. This is the 31st seminar or conference in the anti-corruption law program history in our six years in operation. It's our second this year, uh, and it's the 10th in our series of webinars, which we started in 2021. And it's an example of how three leading organizations, all of whom uh, have different core competencies, but all of whom have a keen interest in fighting corruption, how these organizations can take collective action to work together uh, to provide um, high quality uh, continuing professional education. Uh, and the way that we do it is to bring together leading experts in the field of anti-corruption, uh, and basically, we teach each other uh, about the best ways to fight corruption uh, and to promote integrity. <clears throat> I'd like to give special thanks to Dr. Carol Liao, who is the director for the Center uh, for Business Law at Allard, and her technical team, uh, today led by Justin Chuor, uh, and as well as uh, my colleagues uh, at the uh, Transparency International uh, Canada, that's James Cohen uh, and uh, Suzanne Cote Freeman and our board of directors. Uh, and also uh, to Peter German, uh, who is now uh, the, the head of the Vancouver Anti-Corruption Institute for your continuing support. And special thanks uh, to Norm Baldwin. Norm, uh, uh, like in all of our sessions, uh, plays a very important role. He's a member of the senior management team of the anti-corruption program. Uh, and a special thanks as well uh, in advance to our panelists. So today uh, I'd like to now turn it over to our moderator, uh, Paul Townsend. Paul as well is a friend uh, and a colleague. He's currently his day job. He's the head of risk and audit services for Atlas Corporation, which is a New York Stock Exchange listed company. Uh, and C-SPAN uh, Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Atlas. Paul's got 30 years experience in risk management, audit, and compliance, having spent 16 years at TK, one of the world's, TK uh, Corporation, one of the world's leading energy shippers. Uh, he also uh, has an important role in the anti-corruption movement globally. He serves as vice chair of the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network, He's been a thank, thankful for us a guest lecturer at a, the anti-corruption law course at uh, Allard, uh, a frequent panelist uh, with our program, co-author uh, with John and myself and a, uh, a chapter in Jerry Ferguson's new book on global corruption, law theory and practice. Uh, he's moderated several sessions and been a panelist at various sessions uh, and serves as a key member of our senior advisory team for the program. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Paul. Uh, and again, thank you everyone for participating. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, before um, we get started, as Joe mentioned, uh, the anti-corruption law program is connected with the uh, University of British Columbia. So we would like to acknowledge with gratitude that its campuses in Vancouver are situated on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations, while UBC's Kelowna campus is the territory of the Say Alix Okanagan Nation. Um, we're looking forward to our discussion today. Uh, wanted to let you know right off the bat that we welcome questions. Uh, there's a Q&A section there. Um, we'd, we'd love to have you ask uh, questions um, and uh, we'll do our best to get to uh, all of them. Um, but I'm so excited about our discussion today and our group of expert panelists. Uh, ESG reporting, is, as many of you know, is still quite new and its impact and complexity 
is growing quickly uh, with ESG ratings and institutional investors uh, putting heavy pressure on executives and boards uh, to improve their ratings. So we want to explore this more in depth. Um, questions like, are ratings helpful? And are we focusing enough on the, the G in, in governance and specifically anti-bribery and corruption systems? And uh, what can companies do, not just for improving their ratings, but uh, more importantly, about actually improving their governance? So let me first uh, introduce our expert panel uh, with a much, much shortened version of their experience and, and credentials, and, uh, and then we'll get started. So uh, first off, I'd, uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Amy Sandu, who's the founder and principal lawyer of Lex Integra. Uh, Amy is a Canadian leader in building ethics and compliance programs. She frequently speaks on corporate ethics, anti-corruption and compliance. And Amy is also a board member of Transparency International Canada. Uh, also uh, love to introduce uh, Sharon Singh. She's the partner of regulatory and ESG for Bennett Jones uh, LLP. Uh, Sharon advises on regulatory uh, governance, environmental water and Aboriginal law to the infrastructure, mining, energy and construction sectors. And Christy Stevenson is the executive director of Center for Business Ethics at UBC uh, Sauter School of Business. And before joining uh, UBC Sauter in 2016, Christy spent more than 15 years in the field of socially responsible and impact investing. Uh, she also serves on the boards, uh, forums, and committees uh, related to ESG initiatives. So very thankful to have all of you on the panel and uh, excited about hearing from you. I'm, I'm excited personally to learn uh, more about this topic. I've been involved in in ESG um, for quite some time, but uh, love to learn from, from each of you. Um, so I thought a great place to start uh, would be with Christy, given, given your background, um, it, you know, there's so much uh, noise and misunderstanding about uh, ESG and because it's just risen so quickly, um, a good place to start might be to have Christy give us an overview of the complex landscape of ESG investing. So Christy, over to you. Okay, thanks. And great to be here. Yeah. And I think actually a good, I don't know how many folks uh, who are here today will have had a chance uh, to see uh, the chapter uh, linking bribery and corruption really in the context of the ESG movement, ESG investing movement uh, by Daniela um, Chamiso uh, Dos Santos, uh, which is really a good kind of starting point. Like you said, Paul, there's a lot of noise. Uh, there's an overwhelming uh, amount of content uh, to navigate out there. And she's got a really, you know, really simple uh, starting point uh, linking those two topics. Um, I, I sort of think in the, the ratings piece, uh, I think through a little bit about how where they come from, like how we create these ratings, uh, and then where they go. And she's got a, a, a sort of an ESG financial ecosystem uh, that she lays out, where you have the issuers uh, really responding uh, to, to the public markets, uh, driven by both required and uh, and voluntary disclosure, uh, putting information out in the marketplace. You've got then the ratings providers uh, aggregating that information analyzing that information, uh, but also working with the companies to provide information where there are gaps uh, in the disclosure uh, organizations or guidance. Uh, and then uh, and then also driven by the, then selling that that information and that analysis and going out and doing additional uh, work um, in the field around controversies. So if it's on bribery and corruption, for example, uh, and companies aren't uh, offering up uh, that information, uh, then going out and really digging um, and then providing that to both the asset managers who then flow that up, provide that uh, to the asset owners. So sort of she lays out this whole uh, chain um, and situates the, the bribery and corruption pieces uh, within governance, uh, as you we, we do find it in the ratings. Um, 
And so, yeah, I, I so my, so my background, I, I spent 15 years as the person who worked for a firm called Sustainal, what is now Sustainalytics, uh, gathering that information, constructing those, uh, those, uh, method, the methodology, uh, and then went, uh, into, um, the, uh, asset, uh, management side where we bought, you know, everybody's data, every, you know, all the rating agencies analysis uh, to drive decision making as an investor, investment manager. Uh, and now I find myself on the board of three different organizations, which are all PRI uh, investor signatories. So seeing it as a board member, you know, sort of what flows up to that level. So anyways, a super interesting uh, topic. Maybe I'll stop there, but. That's great. Thanks, Christy. Really appreciate that. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, the rating agencies themselves? You know, um, we've seen from this article from Daniela uh, that, um, you know, companies like Philip Morris uh, are, you know, on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index and, uh, and yet they're cigarette manufacturers. So what, what do these ratings uh, actually tell us? Um, you know, what, who are these rating agencies? What do they do? And are they measuring uh, the right governance risks? So uh, Sharon, maybe you could uh, jump in and, and help us out with that question. Sure, um, and, and apologies, I've been having a lot of IT issues. <laughs> so if you see my hand going up, that's not intentional. Um, in terms of your question, uh, you know, are they measuring the right things? Uh, you'll find that it depends on, and well, what do you classify as the right thing? One, two, the different methodologies that each of these rating agencies use. So. You know, you, you have the basics that have been laid out, which is risk performance um, and, and sorry, risk exposure, controversies and performance, uh, which look at li literally collecting past data and also looking at the geographic state. But in terms of what factors go into, you know, uh, the governance aspect or the social aspect and how much weighting is applied to it, it varies depending on which a rating agency you look at. So in, in terms of, whether they're measuring the right thing, they all have, uh, in terms of looking at their methodology, they all look at governance, they all look at anti-bribery, AML, anti-corruption. It's, it's a matter of what weight is attracts to that rating agency in terms of the rating that they provide, what is the sort of uh, factor and the formula that they utilize for the anti-corruption uh, uh, part. And in, you know, in some of them, for instance, they, they may leave out lobbying. Um, others, all of them focus on systems and, and, um, and, and you know, legal, uh, legal suits that may have applied. So I think really before, you know, we start attacking the rating agencies or even, um, you know, criticizing them is to properly understand, well, what is their methodology? What are they? What are they measuring? What do they say they're measuring? What is the weight that each of the metric uh, components is attracted to? It some provide, may give thirty percent, um, for instance, to to just the entire governance uh, factor, and within that, what factor do they provide to anti-corruption? Within the social factor, they may give say forty percent. What factor do they ascribe to anti-corruption? So it's not a measure, a matter of whether they're including everything um, and whether that's proper or not, it's to what end. And I think majority of them, well, MS, MSCI, for instance, looks at the materiality of the risk that they're, they're looking at to the company. So whilst we all focus on anti-corruption, and I, I can't think of a scenario, and I know Ami and others can tell me, but I can't think of a scenario where anti-corruption uh, and and bad performance in there. So having uh, essentially corrupt practices doesn't have a material impact on, on, on your business, but you know, I, I could be proven wrong. So that's my, that, that's my sort of, I guess my summary on it. It's really to look at, well, what are they saying that they're measuring? What are the factors uh, that they're measuring? So some may not include lobbying. What is the percentage that they allocate in terms of when they're looking at the overall score that they give to the anti-corruption uh, element? And all of them, to a large degree, have uh, have this information published. So there is no standardization, as there isn't, and uh, with frameworks and standards, mm -hmm. with rating agencies methodology either. Excellent. That really helps. Thanks, um, Amy. Let's let's uh, turn to you. Um, you know, there's a lot of focus on boards and and what boards are doing um, around ESG. Um, 
but in terms of governance, how do we, you've had a lot of experience with boards and how do we get boards and, you know, including that senior executives to focus more on the G, the, the, the governance aspect of ESG? I've always, I've always been a proponent of moving away from um, um, style and going, going to substance. So what does it mean to say that a board has oversight, first of all, just generally speaking, but secondly, if we want to look at ESG or even more narrowly anti-corruption, I would look at things like what is the board, individual board members, individual experience with the topic? And secondly, what is happening at the board level? So for example, are they talking about these topics with some kind of regular cadence at the main board meeting? Are these topics being addressed appropriately um, on each of the committees? So has, has, a, has a review been done at each committee level to say, how does this topic impact this committee and how should we be addressing this? So, you know, the risk committee might look at it one way, the strategy committee might look at it another way, HR or audit might have a different perspective to bring. But, but the question is, how do you take it from like a high level apple pie and motherhood kind of a topic to really reduce it to brass tacks to say, okay, how does this topic intersect with the area of my responsibility? And if I don't know what the answer to that question is, how do I find out what the answer to that question is. So how do I appropriately build a framework so I even can start inquiring about what I don't know? I think to me, it's a two-stage approach. One is recognizing that there may or may not be a level of knowledge or experience, but, I, I, but identifying that, exposing that with a plan to how we're going to um, fix those gaps in knowledge. And then secondly, how do we apply this newfound knowledge to the role of, of the board in terms of governance and tied to that, how can they flow that down to expectations on management? So that sounds very theoretical. So one example is how often do these topics come up at board meetings? Are they by special meeting only or are they a regular standing item on the agenda so that the management, management knows this is gonna come up every single board meeting so I should prepare in advance because I know it's going to come up. It's a standing item, right? So that to me is an example of kind of taking it from a theoretical and down to a very doable and very practical item. Who has control of the board agenda? Has that person added this as a standing item? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I jump in? I, I love it. I love everything you just said. Um, yeah. I think of it as like, so as a director, I think, you know, if it's coming, whatever strategy you're signing off on uh, it, that management is proposing, if you're looking at any issue, so bribery and corruption, you know, you've got to be asking yourself, what, what are the implications of, of, you know, taking on that strategy? What, what exposure, what risk exposure are you increasing? Uh, how are you going to be satisfied that there's adequate uh, mitigation in place? I mean, I'm sort of repeating what you're saying, but I, I think it bears repeating something. This is great. Um, you know, to what extent, you know, it, if the board is, is looking inward, say, if the government, you talked about the different government, the different committees, the governance committee really assessing, uh, you know, the skills and experience gaps uh, in the board uh, and determining what are then those for the board's own mitigation, what are those uh, education priorities for the board? Uh, what kind of advisors does it need that are going to be both with, you know, both management advisors to management, but also a separate, you know, in some cases, set of advisors uh, that are for the board so that you're able to, you know, challenge management on things, particularly if it's an area you feel collectively uh, you have some gaps in. Um, then the nominations committee really developing, you know, those sort of skills and experience uh, priorities, sourcing directors, interviewing prospects to really get at how they're going to bring that skill set uh, into the boardroom. Um, the, the, you know, obviously the risk committee uh, really laying out sort of these risk identification, you know, mapping, prioritizing, um, setting those risk tolerances, ensuring there's adequate reporting when you're getting close to the rails. Uh, the audit committee thinking about in light of these rating agencies, these 
what, you know, the ABC, you know, all the, the different uh, disclosure standards that are out there, are voluntary and regulatory, what are you actually, you know, what is audit going to sign off on, on, you know, public reporting? Um, and then the HR committee, you know, looking at CEO capacity, if these are material topics for the business you're in, uh, looking at compensation and incentive structures that, you know, that might pertain to, to bribery and corruption, uh, and in really ensuring, you know, you know, it isn't one person, bribery and corruption isn't one person's job. So how are you assured that it's really baked into the overall human capital strategy uh, of the firm whose board you sit on? If I can, Christy, I mean, at that last point in terms of um, baked into the, the, the fabric of the corporation, I think that's key. The board is one component of, of, of the organization. And so it really is a cultural shift, right? So it has to be embedded within the organization from the from not just having the policies in place, the policies are only as good as the people that follow it and the people that impose it and the people that audit it. Um, and having those structures in place is, is critical. So, you know, and this is one of the issues um, that people have fault with in terms of just ratings in general, is that it, it focuses quite heavily on what's published and what's available. And it's really the underbelly of what's not available that, you know, I think that worries most of us in terms of looking at practice that need to be stamped out or looking at changes that need to be made. And that's really where the board can play a crucial role. If they, as, as Christina I mean, I said, if they don't have the skill set, boards members are, they just need to be aware that these issues exist. They don't need to be subject matter experts on every single item. They need to be alive to the issues that are there. They need to be able to ask the right questions. They need to be able to get the right expertise. And importantly, they need to be able to hold uh, people at task. And just a simple act of reading and knowing everything about the company and where they're operating and understanding the mechanisms uh, it, it, that they face in terms of geographic risk, potentially, or or what their peers face. You know, it's, it's simple things like that that cumulatively add up, too. So I just wanted to um, just touch on that culture piece, because I think it's just it's so important. Mm. You call it simple. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's it's everything it's and, I, and, and and sorry I see Paul's trying to trying to get in but he no, might no, no. Keep going. out of the bottle Please. here. Um I totally agree Sharon and you know not not to this is going to sound dismissive and maybe it is dismissive so I should own it but the whole idea of having policies in place I mean that's the easy part right like that's like a you know one day exercise uh but that doesn't mean people understand the policy. That doesn't mean the policy actually fits the organization. You know, I once I once helped somebody where they brought a policy to me from their company. They hired me individually, not through the company, because they were worried that they were, they had a worry that didn't turn out to be warranted. But as I was helping them, I said, oh, the policy says you've got this 1-800 number and this officer. He said, oh, we don't have those things. We just downloaded that policy off some U.S. website. Oh my gosh. So they had the policy, but they but this was a, a, at a CEO level who said, oh, but we didn't like we didn't read it. Right. And I couldn't believe how, you know, I suggested to him that might not be the best uh, best approach, but that was outside of the mandate. But the po policies are, are fine. But I, I totally agree with Sharon. Like what you really need is a is a is a is a culture mm -hmm. where every employee knows that the policies exist and they understand how their job function intersects with that policy. Right? Mm -hmm. Those those two things together. And then thirdly, the organization has to make it easy for the employees to implement that policy. Right. So if the policy says something like every employee shall do due diligence, you know, commensurate with the risk. Well, that's nice. But if there's nowhere to put the due diligence, if there's no resources mm -hmm. to pay for the due diligence, if there's no monitoring of that due diligence, then what what has the policy done other than frighten or frustrate employees who want to do it, but don't know how, because no infrastructure was set up to allow the policy to actually be successful. So, so to me, it's culture, but the organization and the board ultimately have to make sure the funds are available so that the infrastructure to support the policies can actually exist and effectively exist. And that to me is often where, where I see work that needs to be done is, is the, the policy, that's, 
like anybody can do that. If you don't have a policy, I don't know why you don't have a day to write one. Uh, it's the implementation and the infrastructure. Those are the ones that I think are, are much more time consuming and expensive. And they have to be constantly um, adjusted to fit your organization because if they don't fit the organization, it's really, in my view, unfair to put the burden on employees to try to make it fit. But that's that's a, getting us into a different different. Yeah, topic. and can yeah, I just say on culture? I feel like every board, every director talks about how it's important to have a read and a tracking and on culture and. I don't think people are satisfied that, you know, collectively the director community is there yet. It's hard to figure out how to really, yeah, do that work. But I think you're absolutely right. It's so important. Yeah. And Amy, that's a great point because I've seen that in so many organizations where they just get a policy up, they get a whistleblower hotline in place and, uh, and they, they purchase a canned training program and they're done. And so I'd like to explore that a bit more because, you know, in, in a way, ratings are kind of driving this behavior because all the ratings uh, from a lot that I've looked at, you know, if you've got the policy, if you've got the hotline and you've got some canned training program, you're good and you're going to score really well. So I'd like to hear from the panelists on, on that. How do we get away from this um, almost like a, you know, virtue sig signaling type of approach? Maybe I'll jump in first. I, I don't necessarily agree that um, the rating agencies just focus on what's, I mean, I know that that's a component, but I, that's, again, it's a component, right? So there is a geographical risk as well, and there is controversy. So the last piece in terms of the controversies piece and that the company can't escape from. And I don't think, you know, the sort of copying and paste job of um, that Ami described on policies has, has started coming up since, you know, rating agencies popped up. I, I think they've always existed. Mm. And to some extent, what they're, you know, what we're, and uh, uh, so I, I want to cut a bit of slack to rating agencies in, in that regard. And I, I think in terms of the exercise, whether it's greenwashing or, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, it, it's, it's, always existed you know we had csr reports sustainability reports and and really you know media releases until such time as you know the the venture exchanges got got involved but they've existed so i, I don't a blame rating agencies for that second in terms of what um behavior changes uh, has those rating agencies resulted in i think it depends on the jurisdiction that you're you're also involved in so sophisticated analysts and sophisticated investors and that doesn't need to be institutional. They can be, you know, everyday um, Gita and everyday, you know, Ajay, for instance. So it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, your, you know, your your large institutionals. But they look at behind the rating agencies, and rating agencies only provide one aspect, right, of the diligence that needs to be conducted. There is a myriad of other uh, diligence that you need to conduct, and so to the extent that you do that pure evaluation you look at okay well yeah you have the policies in place but what are you actually doing what what's what are your peers doing um you know or or, or doing some of that more deep dive diligence as required the rating agencies aren't going to do that for you it's just a number at the end of the day and they have some of them are in the business of providing services to improve that number as well so there is you know there like you have to look at what do they do and what don't they do and and to and in some instances, they uh, promoted positive behavior because companies are actually looking at okay, well, what are our peers doing. And yes, they can they can go, okay, well, you will use the copy and paste job, a job, but that's not 100% of the time, right? In some instances, it does cost a, a deeper look. So some of the issues that happened with Siemens or, or SNC-Lavalin, you know, things of that nature, they go, well, could that happen to us? And it's just not about getting the rating number. It's the reputational risk that carries mm -hmm. with having any sort of exposure to those issues. And I think that goes beyond just that no annual number that comes out. So uh, it, it's both a positive call in my in, in my view and a negative because mm -hmm. I think the, the actors that don't want to create those changes and address those material risks, they're always gonna exist. Um, but until such times there's standardization, there's regulation in this space, but until such time, and you're, you're gonna have that spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, many of you have advised uh, boards uh, and, and train uh, company uh, directors. Um, 
where do you think we are in terms of maturity when it comes to governance expectations and and practices, especially related to anti-bribery and corruption? So I'm going to I'm going to throw out, I actually just saw this this weekend, this stat it's a, a, sort of maybe I mean, I'll answer your question, but I'm going to throw it out here because I thought this is really interesting. And Sharon just mentioned about different jurisdictions, investors in different jurisdictions. Um, and uh, so 2021 RBC's Global Asset Management Responsible Investment Survey. Uh, they look at like 800, 1,000 uh, investors all over the world, uh, institutional investors, um, and they look at what the top ESG concerns are. And I was actually, you know, someone who's sort of in, the, in this work, um, I was really surprised. Uh, top issue uh, globally for 2021 was anti-corruption. Um, I, I, so I, I, it's interesting because we were pre-pandemic so... Um, uh, rightly, I think, uh, focused on climate. And when the pandemic hit, social issues just began and, e and EDI issues began to really sit uh, beside uh, climate as just, you know, absolutely pressing concerns of investors. So I, I actually uh, am really amazed to see that. I mean, that I think says a lot about the timeliness of this conversation. And it was alongside uh, climate change. And, but when they did break it down by jurisdiction, uh, it, it only uh, 50, so 76% of, of European investors uh, saw anti-corruption as one of the major concerns, 68% in Canada. Uh, but I feel like maybe why it's not getting as much attention, at least here as it should, only 52% in the US. And so much of our public market narratives are driven by, by the US. Um, so in terms of, yeah, where, where this fits in terms of the rating agencies, but then also to your question directly, Paul, where it fits, you know, within, you know, really within governance broadly, uh, I, I think we're at pretty early days. I think this is a topic that probably hasn't gotten the widespread attention. And I think that may be about to change. And so boards will, you know, once it's on the, once it's on the radar front and center of the rating agencies, it'll be on the radar front and center of, of publicly traded company boards. Mm -hmm. um, Do you think, Christy, that, that boards should have, need to have uh, regular training on, on the, you know, kind of the ABC within, within governance? So here's the thing that the expectations on boards in the last, you know, 10, 20 years have increased so dramatically. It feels like there are so many um, issues of urgency, uh, you know, just the, the weight of the world is, I think, on director's shoulders, mm -hmm. you know, gone are the days, you know, 30 years ago, where sitting on a board was you know, having a nice lunch, talking about the company strategy, you know, sort of checking out the CEO and playing around a golf, right? I mean, this has become really heavy, heavy work. So I think it's really company specific and industry specific, uh, you know, where that fits in terms of the materiality, uh, you know, of the organization. But to mm. be sure for some, yeah. Mm. Amy, what do you think about that? Do you think boards um, need... I, to, to be honest, I, I want to get a chance to read the report Christy was talking referring to because it actually pleasantly surprises me that 68% of Canadian uh, investors said that uh, because in, in my, un, unless they were talking specifically about international deals, because I do find that in my, in my experience among Canadian business people, there's this, and this is obviously anecdotal, but my what I see is people thinking, well, that's a problem over there. And as long as I'm not over there, wherever over there it might be, uh, it's not an issue. So I don't really have to get that concerned about it. Um, I think, and I'm not sure, Paul, if you mean, do they need specific training on anti-corruption or ESG topics in general? Anti-corruption more specifically. I think what boards need is training that focuses on how this is relevant for them. That's what I think they need in my experience, depending on the jurisdiction that you are in and the individual director or executive's personal experience with being in a company that has faced corruption issues, there really is naivete and complacency. Like I just, I just see, I see a lot of that. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you really hope that people don't need to, you know, to be burned, you know, burned once and twice shy in order to see the risk. On the other hand, I totally agree with Christy that like the expectations on board members is so high. I, I, I feel like any kind of training like this should be coherent. So a board member themselves should understand, okay, through the course of the year, I'm going to get, you know, X number of trainings that fall under the category of ESG. And that this is how these are the specific topics, but that my compliance or my integrity structure and methodology can encompass all of them or should encompass all of them, because I think it is a mistake for organizations to have separate compliance streams, because I think that uh, it makes it cost, it makes it cost prohibitive in terms of money, but also just in terms of the sheer resources Mm-hmm. on like of employees mm-hmm. and I think it's too hard to manage right like I, I, that, that's my view I think it'll be companies will be much more successful if they can understand that all of these various topics can affect their reputation can cause some you know regulatory if not criminal pain if they are found to be on the wrong side of the law whether it's intentional or unintentional and so I think they need to understand how all of these topics present risk, but also that they can't have their head buried in the sand. They need to have a strategy to mitigate, to minimize, understand, minimize, and mitigate the risks. Mm-hmm. If I can, Paul, quickly before you get to another question on this, um, you know, it, it's it's under, interesting because some of the statistics I read that in terms of repeat offenders on this, it's quite high in terms of the large companies. So. Um, it, you know, I, I always look at it um, similar, but also look at it from a perspective of what a- Amy had said in terms of really understanding where the touch points are um, and really understanding where the organization, what roles, um, what do they do? And having that in-depth knowledge in terms of knowing what where to look for in terms of where the systems are in place. And frankly, if, if you're not having instance reported, that's a red flag. And, and so, you know, just, just not just training for the board on understanding, well, you know, what is the law in this space, but training to actually understand those touch points and what to look out for and where the gaps are, that's important. Um, you know, I've heard of organizations also doing similar to safety shares, doing uh, shares about anti-corruption before they start meeting to normalizing instant incidents where you know, normal day, everyday issues come up and you have to make those, as, as you call those, those calls about whether is, is this borderline corruption or bribery or is this, is this okay? Is this legitimate? Having, normalizing those discussions and having them open openly and asking, you know, the board, one thing they can do is what are some of those instances that come up routinely? Um, and, you know, in, when you were at these board meetings, um, typically, you know, you don't get to that granular lever, level. Uh, and unless you have a very specific topic on that particular area and you dedicate um, quite a bit of time to it. So really being intentional, uh, you know, I, I use that word, but intentional on, on this, as you are being intentional on addressing systemic risk related to climate change and the transitional risk related to climate change, you know, you, you need to give it as much focus and get to that level of detail. Um, and it's not, you know, understanding every single person on, on the floor with well, how they're doing it, but having enough awareness to know that if there's not issues being brought up, that you need to be asking the right questions or, or asking whether systems are working or not. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and I've seen that um, at the board level where, you know, the board's happy uh, when, when no issues are raised. And yet, like you said, that can be a red flag in itself. Yeah. And when issues are raised, uh, the board gets mad because, well, how could this happen in our company, I thought we had a great culture. Mm-hmm. So how do we get around that? It, it's it's almost backwards to the way it should be. I have to say that really resonates for me. You know, I'm sitting on a governance meeting, you get your reports and it's like, okay, or it, there's no, no whistleblower, you know, incident reporting. Yeah, okay, is this good or is yeah. this speaking, yeah. is this bad, right? Like it's hard to navigate. And I feel like one of the ways we're gonna go is because there are so many demands on board members, you got say nine people, 
You just aren't going to have, you know, one expert in every topic a board needs. I feel like where we're heading is more toward having broad generalist experts in governance in the boardroom and having more experts as in the boardroom, but not on the board, meaning more advisors. So you've got, you know, you have management because you just, even if you have one person who's an expert on the board, you know, you, you can't as a board be turning to, to one director. You know, it's not, I think sometimes we, we move a little bit too much into expecting these technical areas of expertise because this stuff is wildly complicated. I mean, people who devote their careers, you know, to, to these issues, right? You're not going to have one on every board. And if you did, that, that leaves only eight spots for technical experts and a lot of other things. So I think that, you know, boards are getting more um, mature in terms of um, support for bringing in expert opinion uh, to the boards. What are the questions you need to be asking? How can you evaluate the questions you're getting from management? Um, anyways. I just wanted to go back to um, just a couple, couple steps, seconds back, talking about um, whether or not it's a good thing not to have any any reports come up at, at the board level or at management level. And when I started doing this kind of work, I I sort of used the model of safety yeah. as my model. And it's in in a, in a mature safety environment, the expectation is there will be some minimum number of, of incidents raised. And so I always not not that I had a number in mind of how many ethics and compliance issues should be raised, but the idea is if they're not being raised, that could just tell you that people are too afraid to raise it, or that you know that they don't trust that the mechanism you have set up works, or maybe your mechanism doesn't work. I've I've been in I've looked into issues where, guess what, the phone number wasn't even working, right? The phone number plastered on the posters might not have been working, and so. It's definitely not something you want to set and forget. But coming to your point, Christy, mm -hmm. of um, not being able to have uh, specific subject matter expert among, experts among board members, you know, as we look at anti-corruption as part of the ESG framework, you know, I think I think what the, my recommendation, what the board should be doing, is looking at the commonalities of the issues and looking at the commonality of approaches. And then being able to say, look, I'm not an expert on climate change, but I know from a structure point of view, these are the 10 things I would expect you as management to be doing. And while I'm educating myself separately on climate change, don't wait for that, you know, Mr. and Ms. Management, you come back to me and tell me, you know, have you done a risk assessment within the organization? Mm -hmm. Have you, you know, tell me what the res current resource plan is for this subject matter. You know, do you have a dedicated resource or have you sprinkled an amount amongst, um, amongst other people who already have a whole bunch of responsibility that they can't get to anyway? So I think that on the one hand, uh, the board may or may not, individual board members may or may not have subject matter expertise, but they would have exactly, as you say, governance expertise mm -hmm. and the expertise in terms of saying to management, you have an obligation to manage, you have an obligation to reduce risk. And here are framework questions that I'm going to expect you to be able to answer for anti-corruption, but also I'm going to expect you to be able to answer these with respect to climate change and with respect to modern slavery mm -hmm. and with respect to, um, you know, um, diversity and inclusion, right? Like, like to me, the framework that can be applied and should be applied across all of these quote unquote non-core aspects of business are very similar. And I think that the board already has enough expertise to roll that framework mm. expectation out. Yeah. And to be honest, I mean, that's where the ratings actually can come in helpful. You're asking yourself on a public board, you know, what are investors hearing about where we rank vis-a-vis -vis our peers? How are they analyzing any incidents we've had? You know, what th that should be, in fact, um, you know, a really helpful starting place to, to assess, you know, to know what your your key stakeholders, your investor, one of your key stakeholders, your investors are seeing by the rating agencies and being able to say to management, wow, like we're falling behind here or there's an issue with this or, you know, can you unpack mm -hmm. this for us? Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask Sharon a question yeah. here? Yeah, you're so knowledgeable about the rating agencies. Is there a component in the rating agencies of year over year performance uh, improvement or 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 change whether it's positive or negative 
So, okay. So, so interesting. So it depends. I mean, like so many of these topics, right? There are so many, I mean, I think we're at 125 or something. There are the big ones, um, as, as you guys know, um, and they all have different methodologies and they even will have different methodologies methodologies, you know, within certain sets of metrics or within different topics. Um, so typically, yeah, you've got historic data. Uh, one of the really interesting things we saw, and I think this is a, this this year in the last six months, we saw one of them, a Refinitiv, which was the old asset for, they went back and I've, I've never even contemplated this, let alone seen anyone do it. They, they, they back, they revised their historical ratings and they had some good reasons, you know, the reasons, but anyway, so there's some interesting pieces there. So, right. In some cases, yeah, it's relative. And sometimes it's called absolute. In other cases, it's timeline, you know, where there's sort of, um, um, you know, change and it all. So there's all these different metrics, but then there's also how they get used by the investors. So even if you have uh, information that isn't on a time horizon, uh, investors can use the, you know, the data data and plug it into their, um, you know, spreadsheets and whatnot, their methodologies. The reason, the reason I was asking, and this again, this is ESG, but not specific to anti-corruption, although I think there is some connection to what we're talking about today, especially if you look at it in terms of like sustainability reports. And so I think I mentioned this on, on, our, on one of our preparation calls. So when the Modern Slavery Act in the UK came in, right, companies had, you know, six months from their next annual uh, 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 financial uh, statement period to release their to release their statement, and to be compliant with the law, all you had to do is release a statement and put it on your website, and it had to be signed by the board members. So your statement could be, "I have no statement," right. but as long as that was on the website, signed by the directors, you were compliant. And I, in the beginning, I was like, "Well, this is this is not enough," right? But then I thought about it from the point of view of consumers or the public or even um, the people who, you know, customers of whoever was putting that statement up. And I was thinking, okay, in year one, it might be okay. Hey, I'm thinking about it. I got all these plans, so aspirational, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay for year one. But then when I go back for year two, I'm going to expect to see well, here's what I, here's a concrete specific things I have done from year one to year two. And I'm going to expect to see some kind of an increase year over year, right? Because if you're thinking about it and you're excited about it each year, you're not doing anything, hopefully uh, the public will, will, you know, and then customers will be uh, alarmed by this. And so I was wondering if within the ratings assessment, there was a similar kind of a thing that says, well, for three years, they said they were going to do X, but now it's been three years and that thing has not been done yet. And now, you know, we gave them marks, higher marks before because we wanted to encourage what they were doing. But now we see that there is no actual progress. So this might be outside of the confines of this discussion, but, you know, I think sometimes there is value in keeping up with the Joneses and having these, having these metrics be about they're aspirational. We want you to achieve this. We want you to get here because that's better for society as a whole. It's not necessarily always good for society if we punish you in the beginning, because actually we don't want to punish. We want everyone, we want all these companies to behave better. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder how much of that is built into. Sorry, Sarah, I'm throwing lots of questions. No, no, I, I don't. You know, they're, they're really good. And I have a couple of thoughts and hopefully we won't diverge. And Paul's probably thinking, you guys are, let me no, ask no, a question. Keep going. Keep um, going. But, you know, I, I, I don't, from what, at least my interactions with, with the agents, I don't see the incentivizing behavior part. I think it goes into, well, do you have it or not? And whether it's, uh, it's sufficient or not. But to your point about, you know, just the modern slavery legislation, um, it are, I, I think we're seeing sort of, the shift from the comply or explain and, and you know we have that with EDI or rather just just gender on boards as well to sort of from this sort of disclosure to diligence movement right uh, and so you uh, and it is as you said it is sort of baby steps because um, you know you have a wide spectrum that that's occurring so on the modern slavery element yes you can disclose what some of the you know we, it goes back to the systems that you have in place but I think the key part is is the diligence part 
And so, um, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's sufficient just to say, well, we've disclosed our systems that we have in place and that's sufficient diligence, right? And I think there is a difference between the two that really need to be assessed and companies need to take into account. And I, I, I there are far better speakers on modern slavery um, across, not just, just in Canada and in North America, but in, in, as you mentioned, the EU as well, that have you know, a variety of different sophistications in terms of the where they are on the on, on the development chain. And I think Canada itself now is very, very, um, well, it's far behind, but it, you know, it, it will be climbing that curve quite quickly because we know the government has, has, uh, has finally uh, said that they will be uh, putting in place some legislation in that regard. So um, uh, I, short answer in my view is no, I don't think there's that incentive vacation element in terms of uh, points being built in. But um, I, I do think we're probably going to, as we go through our journey towards diligence, the issues that you've raised really come to the, uh, the I mean, and, and Chrissy that you raised as well, will really come to the, to the forefront a lot more. Yeah, I, so I agree with that. The incentivization isn't really there, but I do think what is reflected is in some cases, you have scoring based on absolute expectations and others are on relative. So if you're in a, a you know, if you've got a set of metrics that are based on a relative, you know, pure comparison and your peers aren't improving, then you kind of don't get penalized for not improving either. But if your peers are improving, all of a sudden your score is falling vis-a-vis uh, -vis your, your, uh, your peers. The other thing about your example, you know, they've made a commitment, they've made that publicly available. You go back next year, where's the action? There's nothing disclosed. So disclosure itself is a whole another piece because you have different agencies treating that differently. Some, if you don't have disclosure, that equals you don't have it. Others, you don't have disclosure. It's treated a little more softly, like it's a bit more neutral. Maybe you just haven't put it out there. And then you actually have some credible agencies. I, I'm not a fan of this practice, uh, but uh, you do have some reasonably you know, credible agencies that actually will do estimation. They'll, they'll, they'll like fill in and they're transparent, but they're, they'll say, you know, we don't, you, you're not disclosing. So we're going to make assumptions about what you have, which I, I don't like, but the, but the other thing is sort of where this information is used, I think is also, you know, in sort of the incentivization piece. I mean, in some cases it's used by the managers to construct portfolios. I mean, it's just buy, sell decisions. On other cases, it feeds into stewardship. So you can have a poor record on something, but that actually gives your manager, you know, the intel they need to now enter into dialogue with you, devote their proxies to possibly file shareholder resolutions, uh, to, to get involved in standard setting work because they've got, whether it's industry wide or whether it's firm specific, you know, they've got these pieces of kind of you know, weakness, like a good firm might have a poor record on one area. And now they've got these, um, you know, they've got that data, which is driving investor behavior, but not always limited to buy sell investor behavior. Yeah, I was, um, I was doing uh, consulting for um, one client, and they were having some real challenges uh, with uh, a rating agency that rated them very poor uh, on ESG. And in their view, it was completely unfounded. But it, it started to become a real problem because their, their largest institutional investor was mm -hmm. going to drop them, mm -hmm. uh, which would have been absolutely devastating to the company, but was going to drop them because of this, this rating uh, that they felt was unfounded. And yet they couldn't, they couldn't change it. So just interested in your, your thoughts around that. I mean, maybe Sharon specifically, like, how do we, how do we deal with this? Are, are investors using uh, the, the ESG rating inputs without really uh, looking into them? Uh, in that case, I would say probably. <laughs> and then, you know, the rating agencies themselves tell you, you know, what are they, uh, how they're meant to be used and how they're not meant to be used. And I don't, I don't think I have, I know any rating agency that's promoted itself as being the panacea for uh, for any diligence that's required on behalf of the investor. So to the extent that you know the the investor in this instance is is and I'm sure there's a lot more than just this one, but um, retail investors specifically, you know, would be would be just relying on these agencies as as being um, as being sort of their shortfall for any diligence that they have to do. And I I don't think that's what the rating agencies themselves say. You know, that's what should be done with their work. And and so um, 
in terms of what can you do, you know, simply the methodology, reading that and understanding it. And that's the, to the extent that you're able to, is that conversation piece. So um, about, again, uh, maybe educating the investor and others about what the rating agency is there to do and, and really being transparent at the end of the day about what systems you actually have in place. And so understanding the methodology, again, is I, I go, keep on going back to that because I think it's just so crucial um, because you really need to know, read the instructions of the tool that you've been given before actually using mm -hmm. that tool. And I just see it being used the wrong way over and over again. Mm -hmm. I love that. The headline this morning I saw was, is Tesla ESG? And you're just like, oh, my God, you know, you take sometimes investors or the media or the public, they'll take these incredibly complex, you know, bodies of analysis on a company and a whole range of issues. And all they want to know is like, is it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Well, as an investor, you're going to have a proprietary methodology. You're going to have data inputs. You know, I mean, it, you can't really. It's not that simple at the end of the day. <laughs> Just on the Tesla thing, um, and in general, like, you know, the debate about whether Elon Musk's tweet was uh, appropriate or not. But, you know, again, rating agencies are not there just to look at whether Tesla is going to solve the world's problems when it comes to getting, you know, gas fired trucks and whatever off the road. They're looking at also governance. They're looking at what happens with the battery. They're looking at, you know, what is the footprint of, of the supply chain? Where is the supply coming from? So it's a myriad of different factors. And to simplify it into, well, we're we're helping, you know, solve this great issue that's facing mankind. But it's like, yes, you are on one aspect, but there is the ESG encompasses a variety of things. And it looks at materiality assessments. And, and you know, we can't get away from that. Simplifying it to impact investing or simplifying it on a value-based sort of investing standard. I just think, Again, that's not what ESG is to me. It might be for, for others. For me, it comes back to the fundamentals of what is material to the corporation. And, you know, and I do firmly believe that it, addressing climate change um, in terms of through the corporation is important because otherwise it increases costs at the long run and you're not future-proofing the organization. So there is that link, but I think people quickly jump to impact investing and, and value-based investing when they think about ESG far mm -hmm. too quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I noticed in the, uh, the article uh, that Danielle wrote that, that has been sent around um, said that only 8% of uh, metrics in ESG reports or sustainability reports are G or governance related. Um, so, you know, does, does that suggest that um, rating agencies aren't focusing enough on the, on the governance side, let alone the, the anti-corruption compliance side? Uh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll answer it this way, um, is, you know, when we look at anti-corruption, like at least I look at anti-corruption, it's not just limited to the governance piece, right? It, it sometimes factors into the methodology and the social piece. So um, uh, in terms of whether, I, I think if you want to focus on anti-corruption in general, I, I don't think we should just focus on whether, you know, there's enough weighting being given to the GPs. I think look at it as as an issue and how each of the elements under both the E and the S and the G are sort of factored because they're all are interconnected. There's only, you know, the, there's very limited pieces that are not interconnected. So uh, in terms of, I think it's MSCI, maybe Christy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but MSCI, I think, deals with some of the anti-corruption issues under social. Uh, and that's where the the factoring comes in. So, you know, they 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 also look at, for instance, real estate components may have a higher governance uh, criteria than they would on the E. Um, and similarly, mining would have probably an equal rated, um, both the E and the S and the G. So I, I think, again, go back to where is it showing up in, in, in terms of their factors, rather than just focusing on, on, on the perception that, you know, if it's anti-corruption, it's gonna be tagged under G, because as supply chains, for instance, go show up in both S and, and, and the G. I'm going to jump in here because there's construction outside and they've taken a little break. Um, I think it also depends on how they're asking about it, because it could be just from the sheer total number of questions that the questions themselves might be more higher level questions. So the answers, I don't know, maybe the answers are longer and the answers are more qualitative. So the questions might be more qualitative than quantitative. So the questions possibly could be around, you know, 
what is your governance structure? And the answer to that could cut across different, like it could cut across a larger part of the topic. So I think uh, it would be interesting to talk to Daniela. I know she couldn't uh, attend today, uh, but it would be nice to talk to her more about that. I'll just throw out the other thing is, you know, taking a look, I think it's really important with these rating agencies, they're not all the same in terms of who works there, how many people, what data inputs they're using. I mean, you know, as an analyst here, I mean, I don't know when I was an analyst sitting in Toronto and you're trying to unpack some incredibly complex, you know, on the ground supply chain you talked about or whatever the issue is, you know, they, some of these firms are really well resourced and they have some pretty heavy hitting experts on a lot of different topics and some are not. Um, and they're relying on, you know, newspaper stories and et cetera. So yeah, there's a capacity issue there too, I think. I'm just throwing that and, out. It's a bit off topic, but I just feel like I want to say it. <laughs> that's all right. I think we're all over the place, but it's a good conversation. Um, the other point I wanted to make, Christy, as, as you reminded me, is that, um, you know, you can take one company and look at their ratings across the different uh, rating agencies and you'll probably find a great divergence. It's, yeah. it's not just within a margin of error, like some just because of the methodology and where they weight things and what, what they consider to be material, how what inputs that they have. It's 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 quite all over the place in that in, in instance. And I think that's where similar to standards and frameworks, you know, when you have some standardization rules and they are being discussed at a variety of uh, different jurisdictions, including the UK um, on rating agency, what they have to consider, and and some of them do publish in terms of how they, what factors do they consider, what is their the formula that they adopt, and frankly, when they start using calculus, I, it just they lose me. But I know there's a formula behind it, um, and and frankly, just standardization in terms of reporting. So you know whether it's going to be the GRIs of the world or something akin to that. And, and the, the standards uh, bodies are looking at that. And so once you have standardization reporting, the ratings kind of, um, to a large degree, you know, won't fall away, but the, the, some of the sort of divergence will ease. And I think you'll, you know, the, there won't be the depth of the rating agents in, in my view, even because people are, you know, inherently they want other people to do the work for them if, if they can. And they're, they're not all built to have the multi-level, you know, complex systems in place to analyze the data that these rating agencies do, but at least to the extent that standardization is brought in, which is a movement that's occurring, um, you will find probably a little less uh, divergence in terms of how these rating agencies assess what they assess and what factors that they need to, um, to actually assess. So I think you're exactly right about that. And I, I, so this is my prediction, how things are going to shake out is, you know, we're going to see standardization largely on, on the reporting side. The, the investors, I think, will, will develop in terms of maturity, in terms of having their own methodologies, their own views, using their inputs in those own way. And I think that the, the role that rating agencies, I think where they're going to shift, because they're not going to be data aggregators anymore, because that'll be just, you know, that'll be in you know, reporting, will be standard. They will focus more on analysis. That's my opinion. And I think that's a, a really important role to play. So they won't be they, it'll be the investor that determines the methodology of what they want to weight, but the and and the the issuer will provide the reporting. But the agencies, I think, will shift away from being what we've seen as rating agencies broadly to getting more into the space of analysis, which I think is really really important work and will be helpful for the investor community because the investors have got to take responsibility for their own methodologies. They need to get literate on this stuff, and the disclosure will all eventually you know, eventually will be there harmonized, I think. But I, what I wanted to add here is, I think there's also, you're talking about resourcing and capacity, Christy, but I also wonder what level of knowledge the individual uh, employees working at the ratings agencies even have. So as they're formulating their questions, as they're assessing their answers, uh, I, like, I would look there to try to drive some improvement. Because I know, I know in some of the work that I do, even among people who are so-called experts in the area, I'm sometimes surprised at their how superficial some of their knowledge is or how it's limited to that slice that they work in. And I don't always see that in some of these areas, in Canada anyway, that there's a lot of in-depth knowledge in terms of anti-corruption 
and processes inside a corporation. And so, I mean, I, I doubt any of these rating agencies are Canadian focused or Canadian based, but that would be some an area I would look to is how knowledgeable is the rating agency themselves yeah. in the area that they are that they are uh, you know compiling these ratings for. I mean, to give you a sense of how far we've come, so Sustainalytics was started in Toronto. I worked there uh, in two, started in 2000. Uh, when I was hired, there were five employees. We were covering, you know, hundreds and hundreds of companies, five employees, all topics. You know, uh, I can tell you, uh, you know, we were relying on a lot. Of, you know, it was it was early days, right? We were taking uh, small data sets and really characterizing, uh, you know, taking them as proxy. Uh, that one firm, I mean, they have, I don't know, a thousand analysts all over the globe. I mean, the maturity is incredible. I mean, you know, people were doing their best, but, but unfortunately, while some firms have, have brought in those type of experts you've described, there are others which are kind of making some pretty bold pronouncements that have some pretty transformative implications for the capital markets with some pretty limited resources. So I, I agree, like it's so important to be understanding who the, who's behind these agencies, particularly, you know, or these firms, especially if you're the investor buying their research, right? Because some of them are, you know, really good and really well-resourced and not all. Amy, earlier you touched upon um, the use of frameworks uh, within an organization. And, you know, one of the, the frameworks that I've used uh, repeatedly, which is excellent for, for anti-bribery and corruption, is the DOJ's hallmarks of, of an exceptional compliance program. Um, is there a place um, for that kind of a framework to help deal with this issue around anti-corruption and compliance with respect to ESG? Is there a place for that, not only within companies, uh, but for the, the rating agencies uh, to use when they're assessing companies? And will that help to drive some of that standardization that we're looking for? I think so. I like the DOJ um, guidance on um, on com compliance programs. Uh, my my favorite one is because it's the one I started with. Well, for two reasons. I like the World Bank Integrity Compliance Guidelines document, especially the orange one, because if you print it off two by two, it's a brochure. And I just find that it's really, really easy to read and digest and talk about and it just it just talks it really shows you how how communications are done can really drive understanding of the topic. The DOJ one is great, but it sort of looks intimidating because it's kind of big, even even bigger, even worse. Uh, even though I am ISO certified, is the ISO thirty seven thousand and one mm -hmm. uh, anti bribery management system document because that's like fifty pages, and I just think that. If you want to bring people into the fold who are relatively new to the area or who don't know where to start and it seems overwhelming, I like the World Bank ICGs. The document itself is just so well presented that it's it's really easy to bring people into the conversation. You know, mm -hmm. it's sort of written in a plain language way, and they can graduate to the DOJ. But yeah, I think that's exactly the kind of tool that um, either companies themselves can use or that people working at the ratings agencies would be using. I mean, again, I'm assuming that the people doing the ratings have their own metrics and are relatively educated in these areas, I mean, just, just to make their own lives easier, but also to make sure that the output is, mm. is more valuable. Mm. But yeah, I think, um, and we can provide, uh, provide links. So I think the DOJ, the World Bank, and um, the ISO 37001 are all pretty good documents. What do you think of the, the serious fraud office one from the UK? Again, I think personally, I think they're doing an exceptional job in terms of communications. And, and partly I think that because I'm like, Canada, look, look what the UK is doing. We should do that too. So hopefully, you know, we can move in that direction. You know, um, I just love how you can go to the, the SFO's website and you can like download um, cases, mm -hmm. you know, statements of claims, statements of facts. I, I often direct um, people there for the uh, um, um, Bombardier, or not, uh, Rolls-Royce, the Rolls-Royce case mm -hmm. from 2017, 2018, because it's just a well laid out document. Mm -hmm. And it's like reading like a, like a thriller, a crime thriller. 
so yeah, I think I think anything that people can any websites that can be created where the information is easy to locate, easy to read, um, are, are just their minimums to me. Like I think every jurisdiction should be doing that. In a minute, we're going to jump over to some of the the Q and A um, from the participants. But just before we do that, you know, we've been we've been talking about um, you know kind of focusing on governance for um, big companies. I think for the most part, um, let's let's talk for uh, a minute about kind of these these junior companies, smaller companies they, they can't have compliance officers. And, and all these kinds of resources, um, what what can they do? Um, because you know, if they're listed a listed company, they still uh, uh, you know have to um, you know score well on these ratings. What can smaller companies uh, do to to make sure that they address not only you know get a decent rating, but have uh, a really effective compliance program? Right, can I take this one and then I'll leave the ratings piece uh, to Sharon and to Christy. I think if you have a limited budget and you're just starting into this, I think that there's three or four things I would recommend. Well, one, have a code of conduct and have an anti-bribery policy. Like just, just get those, make those, right? Second, thirdly, make sure you have some method uh, that people can report wrongdoing or alleged wrongdoing. Like there has to be some kind of open trans, like open communication or transparent communication process so that people will feel like there's a point in raising an issue. Um, the fourth thing is look at your highest risk. Probably they're intermediaries or third parties doing things on your behalf. How many do you have? What are they doing on your behalf? What kind of oversight was there in terms of bringing them on board? What kind of due diligence was done and is do, being done on an ongoing basis? Who monitors them? How are they getting compensated? Uh, and fifthly, how is this information all being reported up to the board on a regular basis? So that's my that's my quick and dirty list. Uh, I mean, uh, I can't really add to that except to say my, my baseline always is education and culture, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, again, going back to where we initially started, you can you can have everything in place, but if you don't have the education in terms of how do people utilize the tools, um, how to you know understanding where the risks emanate, what are some of the everyday examples that the, they might face, I think it, it it's policies are as, only as good as as what as when you apply mm -hmm. them. Um, and in, in terms of and everything else, Ami says, I mean, I'm just going to repeat it because then you know. It's just me repeating everything eloquently that she put it. But in terms of the rating agencies, I mean, that, that, that's an interesting one. And I think, you know, you do suffer to a large degree. But remember that rating agencies don't cover every single um, a single company out there. So and to the extent that they cover yours and you don't have that capacity and you somehow do want to engage in that exercise and ensure that, you know, they are adequately representing what is actually the status um, with, you know, in, in terms of how you're performing and what systems that you have in place. I, the communication aspect of it is, is I think, the relatively easy part to do. Um, and it, you know, you can put something on your website that describes exactly what Ami had said in terms of um, the systems and, and information that you have in place. And, you know, the rating agency is going to go on your website and see what you have, um, what you have done. You know, you don't need a very fancy, you know, 200 page sustainability report to lay that out for them. But to the extent that you have that aspect, yes, that's one aspect, but looking at just the fundamentals of it, I, I don't think they really change. The only piece that you might suffer from is, um, is the communication piece, but the governance piece, I, I think it's immaterial whether you're small or, or big because the fundamentals are still the same. Mm. Mm. The only thing I, I would, I would add, and I think this is, this is part and parcel of what Sharon was saying, but I might just, just draw it out uh, a bit longer, a bit more, is as part of that culture piece, um, and what I should have said first is, is just tone from the top. And maybe it has a different catchphrase now than it did before, but how committed is the senior leadership team, like the chair of the board, the CEO, 
president, how committed are they to these principles? And mm-hmm. how is that uh, how is that commitment being demonstrated, right? Like, how would, you know, can you pick up the phone and call any employee? And if you ask that employee, does your company have a zero tolerance towards bribery? How would those employees answer that question? Mm-hmm. And if they're going to answer with anything other than, yes, we have a zero tolerance policy, what do you have to do so that the inher- the quick answer and the true answer from those employees is, of course, we don't permit this or tolerate this, mm. right? Like what, what has to happen uh, for the senior leadership team to communicate that message in a meaningful way? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, you know, that's a great point. I had, um, you know, experience um, in some companies where you know, every time I went around to different offices around the world and clearly communicated the standards of business conduct policy and demonstrated how senior management took it seriously and acted upon hotline calls and everything, um, I would immediately following those meetings, get some calls from people who would just call me directly and say, hey, you know, this something's been bothering me for a long time. And you know, mm. given you guys take this seriously, uh, here it is. So, you know, Paul, and I would and I would say in your example, why were you telling them how seriously management was taking it? Why wasn't management themselves conveying that message directly? Well, I was part of management then. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't a consultant then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Anything else to add on that? Before we jump into um, uh, some questions, um, I, I just wanted one aspect, and the one that I always look for. I don't know why, but um, you know, asking the employees or anybody about their their expense policies um, that they have, and that's a relatively easy one because it touches everybody, right? It, it, and and those, especially those that have interactions with government, and I often see that is where the line gets crossed quite quickly. And uh, and and easily because it's like oh it's just a coffee right um, we're we're and and so asking about the expense policies in terms of or gifts entertainment policy and then that one if people can remember that that's a good indicator for me in terms of okay you know um, like a they have something in place b they're actually abiding by it and that's typically where this you know if we're going to start with the the small things it those are the ones that accumulate so I don't I don't know why but that's one of the one of the diligence aspects that I always look for, and uh, I've found a few um, cases where uh, it, it sometimes uh, it is not clear when it's clear in law um, to the employee. <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree. And in fact, it's one of those areas where if I ever found something wrong, uh, you know, that was going on with expense um, submissions, I would go to not the employee first. Um, but their supervisor first and say, why did you approve this? Yeah. And uh, and that really sends across the message that, listen, this is all of our responsibility mm-hmm. um, to make sure that we have good governance over these areas, which, you know, expenses, as you mentioned, is a huge area for anti-corruption uh, and compliance. Mm-hmm. So let's jump to... Uh, first question, and just just a reminder to participants: um, if if you've got a question, please uh, throw it into the the Q and A, and and hopefully we'll get to it. Um, so this question is uh, a traditional responsibility of a board is to establish the organization's risk appetite, and so how is this function of the board being impacted? by ESG requirements. Christy. Uh, yeah, I'll do with that one. So uh, uh, hugely, I, I think hugely, I, you know, as, as directors, you know, the sort of standard guidance say by CPA Canada, 
on on risk is really breaking down organizational risk into sort of a, the three levels, like level one, which has been traditionally operational uh, and can be mitigated, uh, or uh, you know, th- there's ways to sort of insure against, etc. Uh, and then, so not you know, needing a lighter touch by the board, um, sort of the level two risks where the board really does need to be involved in the risk appetite, uh, the risk uh, oversight, setting those parameters, and monitoring. Um, is really either those which are high impact and can't be adequately uh, mitigated or those that involve the, the, the presence potentially of management bias. And then you've got level three where you clearly have management bias, things like you know CEO oversight um, but or performance evaluation. And I just think that ESG has become material uh, to the point in so many ways and in so many places, it is absolutely on the radar, uh, you know, of, of whether it's the audit committee or the, the risk committee, if they're if they're separated or, or combined. Um, and there are a whole range of those issues um, within ESG uh, that are absolutely, I think, uh, transforming the work of, of risk committees and, and directors. Mm. Amy or Sharon, anything to add to that? And, and could I say, you know, they are because they're material, because they're impacting uh, the ability to attract and retain employees, these mm. ESG factors. They are, uh, they are material because they're impacting the mm. ability to retain and, and attract uh, customers. They're driving, you know, their yeah. they're, they're preoccupations of the regulators. Uh, they are, uh, you know, their their preoccupations of, of the investors. So mm. there's hard, it's hard to point to... Um, a, a, you know, an important decision maker or stakeholder mm. uh, that isn't now really looking at some, if not a broad basket uh, of ESG risks on companies. Yeah, that's a great point you made about, um, you know, hiring, um, you know, employees more than ever are looking yeah. to ESG ratings before they decide to consider even consider an employer. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to, I was going to take it a, a bit more of a, of a micro uh, level to try to complement Christie's answer, which is more macro. Um, and I was thinking about it from the point of view of anti-corruption, but I think this could, could apply overall. It's, does the board have an, does the board understand the business of the organization enough to understand how different product lines, for example, some might be better, some might be worse for different ESG um, components. So for example, it, let's say if it's a if it's a textile company or a clothing manufacturing company, do they have a clear enough understanding of of which which fabrics or which textiles are coming from which countries, or do they have a clear enough understanding of where their products are being made, or where their subcontract or how much of their work has been subcontracted to another jurisdiction? So me- meaning that does the board have enough of an understanding of the differentiation? of what the company itself is doing so that at a strategic level, the board can say, we think, we think business, you know, product basket number one, you know, we understand the risks in this way. However, product basket number two now looks too risky to us. So de-risk it. So it Mm -hmm. looks more like product number one or in some other way, but Mm -hmm. basically do they understand the business enough in terms of its supply chain, in terms of how the business itself can engage in more or less risky uh, ventures and the jurisdictions and third parties that they're involved with. Mm -hmm. Because I think that it's not always the case that you have to exit a business or a business line. It could be if you modify an aspect of it, you could be de-risking it from an ESG point of view or an anti-corruption point of view. And sometimes they're the opposite, right? Like one of the things I think that we don't spend enough time talking about is how when we try to improve one thing, right? From an ESG point of view, we might be, you know, making something else worse. Mm. And do we have a clear enough picture of, of those elements? Mm. Yeah, great point. And uh, especially bringing in the whole, um, concept of the risk of your supply chain which is which is a massive risk and and one that you know could take you down a whole bunch of different uh trails that may as you say decrease your risk in one area but maybe increase it in another 
And, and can I say, I think also that, it, that it's key for boards to understand sort of risk and timeline around mm -hmm. ESG. There are some ESG risks that are just these slow burn, you know, if you don't have a, an environment that, you know, is respectful around EDI, let's say, you know, you're going to have a kind of, you know, human capital problem, which is, you know, people aren't bringing their whole selves to work that, you know, they're, they're, there's like a, a sort of a slow burn risk. And then there's other things. That, especially with social media, there's you know some little thing that doesn't seem that big, um, maybe around ESG, but it's it just captivates the public and and impacts your share price uh, instantly. Um, so there there's some of these sort of systemic uh, ESG issues, um, and uh, and then some which are very quick uh, to to be impactful. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like anti corruption. I feel like corruption is one of those. You can have corruption which stays under the radar for a long time, uh, but really does have a very very damaging impact on the company. Um, and you have other instances where corruption surfaces into the public domain and is just uh, impactful. And you know instantly you know just just on that and it's it's interesting because for me what this sort of rapid sort of increase in esg discourse has really done at the core of it is really highlight the decisions and how they are ought to be made and connecting the pieces of the puzzle mm -hmm. that you know what are those material topics that someone in, in say a board or management position really needs to consider to ensure that they have the best interest of the corporation mm -hmm. and that they are working towards that goal. So what it's done is not really added anything really new at the core of it. It's just brought the conversation a lot, I mean, a lot more to the forefront because climate change and the risk associated with that have been discussed for some time now. Yeah. Similarly, corruption has existed since time immemorial. Um, EDI issues have been discussed for a really long time, you know, be it started from gender or, or race or whatever have you. But what it's done is really drawn that link to why is it material and what, how is it connected to the organization's success? Mm -hmm. And I think that part of it is is quite interesting and and actually exciting because you know these like I said I mean again we have these issues are not new um like they're all the issues that we're discussing are not new and ESG is somehow didn't create the momentum for them to be addressed mm. um because ESG has is, has existed you know before 2019 for some of some people that may believe it or not um, um but it, it's just interesting because I think a lot uh, when we when we talk about it, it and in terms of uh, discussing it, it seems like we forget that the body that existed, the regulatory framework, at least, or the legal framework that existed, existed for quite some time. But mm. what we're now seeing is that disclosure and the diligence piece being added a bit more, so it's more transparent, mm. Mm. Uh, especially for public companies. You know, you've always had to report aspects that that are material that would have a material uh, impact on your on your organization. You've had to report that. Uh, I'm not a corporate lawyer, by the way, but, you know, and there's more uh, better ways to say that. But understanding that, hey, climate change or corruption or, or these other aspects have mm. a material impact and therefore you shall disclose it, mm. uh, I think is is more of that broadening of, of the framework and understanding that how is the uh, how is the universe connected and how are the different factors, be it legal policy or, or social impacting Um impacting the organization and I think that's that's quite a interesting piece because I, I read on one of the LinkedIn posts that someone had posted I think it was Norm Baldwin actually saying you know confused by ESG and I'm, I'm not surprised right and then Daniela's piece sort of uh, lays it out uh, as well because the discourse is like what what am I missing what what's new here uh, mm. at times and, and that's hard to sometimes grapple with. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's a great segue into into another question. Um, I'll just read it out. You know, there's there's clear uh, regulatory and compliance requirements, as you said, Sharon, that, you know, regarding bribery and corruption, you know, FCPA, uh, UK Anti-Bribery Act, etc. But how does the basic compliance with laws in this area intersect with the ESG expectations beyond compliance? So what I think, I mean, I think oh, go ahead, please. 
I was going to say, I think it goes to uh, what we were saying earlier about the expectations of the public and of the shareholders and of, of the investors is that, you know, they're not waiting for you to go through a lengthy trial and come out with a guilty decision at the other end of it to say, okay, now I'm not going to invest in you, right? They're not going to wait for the end of a 10 year long trial. They're going to make a decision based on the headline at the first sniff of the charges or the impropriety. And unfortunately, those headlines could be wrong. And so that's sort of like the, the, flip, the flip side to this. But I think a lot of what we are seeing is that there is, um, you know, companies at their peril wait for the outcome of these court cases or compliance and regulatory um, processes because the investment community and the shareholders and the public are not going to wait for the outcome. You know, that's 10 years away or five years away. They are, they have lots of options and they're, you know, I think, I think we can look at things differently from the point of view of consumer oriented decisions and then, you know, B2B, but ultimately nobody's really that keen on interacting with somebody who's got some kind of scandal attached to them. Mm -hmm. it, uh, maybe say two things so there's the, so i love what you said uh, and it makes me think of something it wasn't what i was going to say so i'll just add into that there i mean sometimes there are terrible things that happen to companies and the, the sort of classic that lot, lots of people point to is the listeria outbreak uh at maple leaf foods i mean you know as a result of, of the company people died right it's not they didn't have to wait for the investigation i mean people didn't go home to their families um and yet they were there, there was a response, right? There was a, a learning moment by the company. It's pretty widely felt in the investor community and in the ESG investor community uh, that the company took reaction, took action as, as a result. And so I do think that response is so important because you're right, you can't be sitting around waiting for what the investigation or the courts are going to find, right? But the thing that I was going to say is there's actually this issue around compliance treatment by the rating agencies is really quite a fundamental one because you're you're often you're looking at a company, they operate in, you have to make a, you know, weigh in on, on the performance of the company, you know, make a sort of final pronouncement uh, in different areas. And they often are in, you know, many, many jurisdictions. I mean, global companies are operating all over the world. Uh, different jurisdictions have different standards. You've got, you know, subsidiaries, you've got joint ventures, you know, and so constructing, again, a methodology and investors understanding uh, those methodologies and companies understanding how they've been rated or characterized um, is really important because sometimes some companies will take the view that there's a, uh, sorry, agencies, um, firms, rating firms will take a view that there's a performance expectation. And if you are, you know, you could be stronger in a jurisdiction uh, because that jurisdiction simply has higher standards. And then you could be weaker in another jurisdiction, but you're in fact exceeding the requirements. Mm. So how do you weigh that out? And so they'll, they'll have different ways that they, you know, sort of opine on that. Um, but you need to be able to unpack that and understand how they are viewing it. And it's, I don't think it's an easy question is which is better or you know, <laughs> but certainly that, that the difference between compliance expectations and performance, when one can actually be result in poor performance, mm. but be mm. beyond compliance, what do you mm. give the credit, the company credit for? I wanted to, I wanted to sort of tie this back to our earlier conversation about boards. Mm. Um, you know, we were talking about the board where there is, you know, we're trying to uh, prevent the wrongdoing from occurring, right? But the other point of view is you could be a board who's looking at approving some kind of a transaction with another entity mm -hmm. who has this whiff of scandal about them. And that board might say, we, why would we want to do business with them? Where's the, where's the due diligence that's been done, uh, you know, that shows how our reputation will not be impacted by this? And so that to me is a concrete example of the kind of um, intervention that's appropriate at the board level to say, we're not making decisions for you, but we would like to understand how it is you are addressing this risk mm -hmm. that we're all aware of. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. ESG discounting and M&A is huge. You know, you've got, you know, Canada, you know, so many companies that are in the business of acquiring junior miners, for example. And this is, mm-hmm. there is no question that is baked into the acquisition price. The, the mm-hmm. reputational piece is positive or negative that they carry with them. Right. Right. Yeah, necessarily. I mean, anytime you're, you're doing M&A, you have to look at, you have to consider ESG. And so what's the right approach uh, for a company that is looking at doing M&A? Is, is it enough, Christy, to look at uh, ratings provided by rating agencies or how much deeper do they need to go? And what if they don't have the resources to be able to do that? Yeah, that's that's an, the I mean, the resource question is a t- is such a tough one because, I mean, like you've said, Paul, there I mean, small companies that aren't at a certain level of maturity are getting hit just as hard with mm-hmm. ESG mm-hmm. expectations. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is because those expectations are there. And, and uh, you know, I don't know how they, they protect themselves when, if they don't have the resources. I mean, it's an yeah. increasingly complex world with just a, a heightened sense of expectation around these issues. Yeah. Yeah, you've got small teams, especially in Vancouver. There's a lot of mining companies that are headquartered here, and they have small, small management teams, um, but operations around the world in, in some of the, you know, riskiest areas of the yeah. world, especially yeah. in terms of anti-bribery and corruption. And, uh, and yeah, and they've got a challenge uh, when they're looking at doing M and A activity. Um, Anyway, that's a whole topic. Yeah, anyway. no, it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just want to get to another question here. Um, uh, and th- this is a tough question as well. How do corporations assess the risks associated with company employees or directors paying bribes? And, and how do you really evaluate that reputational risk? Well, I think the reputational risk is the same. Oh, sorry, Sharon, go ahead. You go, you go ahead. So, okay. yeah, I think the reputational risk is the same uh, as, as we've already as we've already covered. But in terms of how do they ensure that it won't happen? I mean, at, at some level, you, you can't. Mm-hmm. But what you can do is you can have um, expectations set through the recruitment and hiring process. You can have the ongoing training. But, you know, more importantly, have the culture of the organization and the tone from the top such that it is very clear that this kind of behavior is not tolerated. Um, you know, one, one thing that I think is a best practice is if, if the organization has investigations or occurrences that are not good, that in some sort of sanitized version of that indiscretion, you know, hopefully there's a way to communicate it because I think a lot of times what happens is people think, well, that can't happen here, mm-hmm. right? It happens in other places to other people in other kinds of organizations. Mm-hmm. And I think as much as you can do as part of your culture setting and as part of your training is and, and just management sens- sensitivity or, or awareness and raising as possible is make them aware this can happen. Here is a time when it did happen or here is a time when it happened at your competitor. People love those stories, by the way. Yeah. Here's a time it happened at your competitor, or here's a time when it happened to you know somebody else who's sort of very much in your ecosystem. And, and, and so you have to make people aware that it can happen, it, it does, it might happen. And here is the here is the response that we will take if we suspect that it's that it has happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um- yeah, and, and I've, I've actually done this sort of exercise where I've assessed uh, the risks uh, of, of employees uh, paying bribes, and, and there is a way to do it. I mean, you look at things like, uh, you know, are people getting commissions on, on sales? Um, you know, what jurisdictions are they working on? What kind, what, who are the counterparties? Sorry, uh, I misunderstood. Are- I thought you meant, like, looking into their soul. Like, I thought you meant, like, <laughs> yeah. more right. yeah, personal... Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's that too. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 a tough uh, assessment to go through. 
uh, but it can be done and you just do it in the, in the basic way you do any other type of uh, risk yeah. assessment, yeah. Um, you know, impact, probability, uh, mitigation factors, et cetera, et cetera. One, but, one simple one, or not simple, one one thing that I, I found a little bit um, strange, one, one place I was looking at was, is the hiring, the onboarding process for contractors the same as for employees? Mm -hmm. And I found sometimes there's a gap in that. Mm. Where that, where somehow the, the full force of the company's training and expectation setting and culture transmission does not happen with contractors. Right. And if that's the case, um, is there a limit to what kinds of roles those contractors should have in the organization? Right. Right. And especially where, like you say, Amy, um, you know, especially where those contractors may be a representative of the organization in some fashion. You know, a lot of organizations, uh, the only time they rate uh, a consultant or a contractor high risk is if they're helping with uh, business development. But there are several other avenues uh, that third parties can be engaged in representing your company. Absolutely. And those are high risk. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, so you need to go through and do an assessment, not only of your employees, but all your, your third party yeah. representatives. What are they doing? Especially... Especially when some companies won't even have HR involved. If they're hiring a consultant, mm. that that's somehow now that's part of the supply chain, mm. which is which can be fine as long as the same expectation and, and monitoring and culture transmission is taking place. But I don't think that's what supply chain is really set up to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that to me is one of those, you know, in, in infrastructure and implementation things we were talking about at the very beginning is it's nice to have a policy, but if you're not looking at how newcomers are brought into the organization, then you could be, um, you know, um, shooting yourself in the foot, let's put it. Um, well, we've got, we've got uh, one more question. Um, oh, no, actually another one just popped up, but so I'll ask this, um, this question. And uh, you guys will have to help me out because I, I, I wouldn't know how to answer this question. So hopefully you guys do. Um, thoughts on companies slash investors supplementing ratings with enhanced reputational due diligence. I, I don't think it distracts from what we've said before. And I completely agree that they ought to, uh, if that's an area that they, they want to focus on, because it's just part of due diligence uh, in general. So it depends on what uh, you know i think there is the variety of um reputational due diligence uh, that's out there but what are you actually um doing in terms of who's undertaking that and you're going to be asking yourself the same question so whether the the diligence is being conducted by a third party what are they looking at you know how you know how deep are they going are they actually on the ground assessing it or are they simply just looking at what the rating agencies looked at but just focusing on um, on on the risk that this company might face, what the peers have faced, what you know, what, how they've performed recently, but what additional information are they giving you that uh, you need to drill really deeper down to? And I think the same fundamental supply. And I think, but I do agree at least there, it's a it's a good another good tool uh, to utilize. But it just depends on what what are we talking the baseline in terms of what we're talking about, who's conducting, and what are we looking at. All right. Um, th this this last question is is a great question. Um, so, do you think rating agencies should be able to assess companies against a methodology that they have developed, while also offering services to companies to help them achieve those same ratings? Uh, this is the current market situation for several rating providers, yeah. and it seems to be a conflict of interest. What do you think? Well, uh, I won't speak to the conflict part because um, I, I know it exists and I know it's a frustrating part and I've heard it way too often. Mm -hmm. um, I was on a, a, on a call where someone was providing an ESG presentation and, and the question that was asked was a mining company was, I've got a really crappy rating and I just can't engage with the rating agency that's given this to me because all they keep on doing is dropping in front of me a, a package for consultation and then they'll pick up the phone and talk to me. And in that instance, you know, I, I think like that just to me doesn't smell right, uh, frankly. You know, I, I have respect for other rating agencies that clearly lay out 
you know, they've got volumes of information out there in terms of how they look at things, how they assess it, what are they assessing. But I think there is uh, that underbelly that uh, that some rating agencies have, which is the consulting piece. And it's hard. I know that they have, you know, corporate walls between them and their, their different measures, but they're all interlinked to the extent that when you're providing that information, the company needs to be able to act on that information. And if it acts on, on that information, presumably it gets, you know, the the sort of tips and tricks about uh, what a rating agencies are looking for a lot, uh, a lot more so than the, the entity that hasn't sort of attracted the consultate, uh, consulting arm. But, um, and, and again, to, you know, to, to just on the surface, it just doesn't look good. Um, but I also like I go back to the fact that these rating agencies do have a lot of information. They have a lot of good people working for them. And there is, uh, I mean, Christy can speak to this a bit more, but there is corporate separation between the variety of different um, uh, different sort of, uh, I would call them departments that undertake these exercises. So um, whilst it, you know, some in some instances, I think it, it's, it, it would appear to be a conflict, especially where you're saying, you know, a party wants to engage with you to understand what they've done wrong. And you put in front of a, you know, here's a $20,000 consulting fee, and then we'll, we'll, we can engage in that discussion. Um, in other instances, you know, I, I think there is a better way to go forward and, you know, having that discussion, which should be available, everybody's time is money, but having that discussion or, or pointing them to data that's available in for, for rate, raters to basically understand or with the rate e to basically understand um, how they've been assessed, I think is, is a key part. And can I say, I, I would not be able to articulate it better than that. I absolutely agree with all of that. And uh, what I would say is if there's going to be a change in this situation, it isn't going to come from the issuers and it isn't going to come, you know, from the, the eight, from the firms, the ratings firms. Uh, it really needs to come from investors saying, you know, doing their diligence, you know, their due diligence on what information, you know, what sources they're going to be, you know, have as they're going to be clients of and say, okay, walk me through this. So I'm buying your analysis on companies who are your consulting clients. Like, and if, if investors don't have a problem with it, well, then, you know, they're paying for it. That's what they're going to get. But it really is incumbent on investors to understand that um, and determine whether they think it's a concern. Um, but I, yeah, I, I mean, I feel it's concerned, but. I mean, I think, um, I think I would handle it like any other conflict of interest or potential conflict yeah. of interest situation. Yeah. If I was the rating agency, I would be fully transparent. I would have a section on my website that addresses this topic full on and lists uh, whatever countermeasures it is taking in order to minimize that risk and to be transparent about it. For example, saying things like, we'll have two separate um, teams who will look at this information. Here's the kind of information that the consulting wing can have access to. The other thing I would do if I were them is in my, I would give a response. If somebody asked for uh, a response to the question, you know, how, how, how can I do better? I think that they should provide some kind of high level guidance. And to Sharon's point, time is money. So, you know, it would have to be some kind of a fair fee set to compensate them for the time of their people to put it together. But I think they should put something together that the company can take and shop around to any other consultant to say, here's a preliminary assessment of areas that I'm weak in and preliminary, you know, high level recommendations of what I should choose, what I should improve. And now I can take that and shop it around to another consulting firm if I want to say, this is what, these are the things I need help with. Or I might say, well, you sound like what you're doing. You sound like you know what you're doing. Um, so I'd, I'd like to work with you because you already have my information. And according to your conflict of interest policy, I understand how it's going to be imported or not into the consulting side. But I think, I think the number one thing is if they're going to do this, if they have to be fully transparent and set out on their website in a public way, this is our policy. This is how we actually implement this. Yeah, agreed. Excellent. Well said. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Amy, Sharon, Christy. Thank you so much uh, for the discussion. Lively. I've learned a lot. Uh, so I want to thank you personally 
Um, and I want to thank the uh, the participants, the audience, um, uh, asking great questions. Mm -hmm. um, and just so everyone knows, there will be a recording of this event, uh, which will appear shortly on the Anti-Corruption Law Program LinkedIn page, as well as the Center for Business Law uh, website. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Carol for some closing comments. Thank you uh, so much, Paul, and thank you so much to our panelists. I have been so appreciative of this very timely and insightful panel. I want to thank our stellar experts, Sharon Singh, Amy Sandu, and Christy Stevenson for the rich discussion, as well as Paul for his always thoughtful and brilliant moderating. Um, ESG feels like it's everywhere now, it, and its rapid acceleration has been really heartening for many who have advocated for years for social and environmental sustainability, indigenous rights, broader views of value and risk, and a holistic as opposed to myopic view on priorities and interests. Um, as Sharon mentioned, it is a culture shift and one that cannot come soon enough. For many, it should have been yesterday, but this rapid acceleration can be very messy and the education for boards, adopting policies and due diligence, monitoring of that diligence, and most importantly, as Amy mentioned, implementing an infrastructure means there's a lot of hard work ahead and it is ripe for abuse. Anti-corruption and protecting against the intentional abuse of entrusted powers for private gain is a part of the ESG movement and indeed needs to be interwoven in any significant movement. Uh, and as Christy said, it is early days and inevitably there's going to be missteps as new industry standards and rating agencies evolve. We even, we're even seeing some pushback uh, to ESG. I think I just recently saw an article of Elon Musk railing against it, but it isn't going away in the same way climate change isn't. And so these critical discussions on how to educate on systemic risks, how to implement ESG and anti-corruption principles within an organization are essential for healthy companies and fostering sustainable societies, mitigating climate related risk, responding to pandemics, protecting human rights and ensuring a safe, just and equitable space for us all within our planetary boundaries. So this discussion with these experts who are working on the ground on these issues is much needed. And I suspect this webinar is gonna be viewed many times afterwards and in the years to come. So thank you, Amy, Christy, Sharon, and Paul. Uh, to end, the anti-corruption law program has been on the cutting edge of anti-corruption law for a number of years now, delivering free public and accessible information in this dynamic and evolving field of law. I'd like to take a moment to recognize my dear colleague, Professor Emeritus Joe Weiler, John Ritchie, Norman Baldwin, Paul Townsend, Danielle Chimiso Dos Santos, and all the other contributors and incredible team behind the anti-corruption law program. Uh, the conflicts of intersecting crises that we are facing has certainly exacerbated corruption risk. And so prevention and oversight and, and particularly that knowledge that the anti-corruption law program has been sharing and will share throughout 2020 is 2022 uh, is so important. So thank you to all uh, for coming. On behalf of the ACLP and the Center for Business Law, Transparency International Canada, and iClear, uh, if you want updates again on upcoming events, please sign up for the Center for Business Law website. Uh, on the website, there's our newsletter, which is available online, uh, certainly uh, as well with our partners, uh, TI Canada and iClear. We're grateful to you all for coming. Uh, thank you again, and uh, goodbye, everybody. <laughs>